Good morning, everybody. As we go to the Chitas of today, the Chumash of today, on Tuesday, the third reading in the portion of Bechukotai. Buckle yourself in, as they say, as we go into the Teichachais of the Teda, the warnings of the Teda. In this reading, it's a long reading. Holding on chapter 26, verse Number 10. Yashem Noishain and you'll eat your very old produce. Nechadash and you'll clear it out, the old, from before the new. As she says, well, what is the blessing is that you'll eat old food? Say the means, however, that the produce will be well preserved growing mellow with age, so that the old produce from three years ago will be better than the last year's produce. The Yatsumi Chodesh the threshing floor will be full of new grain, grain which would decay if I left it there, and therefore must be stored. The storehouses I will be filled with abundant of produce. Therefore, you'll have to remove that which is in the storehouse and take it elsewhere in your house in order to put the new produce it can be so much in abundance. In the shot, the Mishkani Bisechan, I'll put my I'll put my dwelling place within the midst of you. Le Sigal Nafshi Aschen, my spirit will not reject you. Ash is the Shkani, this is the temple. Le Sigal Nashi, my spirit will not be disgusted with you. Everything, everything, every expression of Gila is an expression of purging of something. That is an absurd, like you do you do the cancer of a gala. When something becomes not kosher, you, you purge it. Nigal. Verse 12. I will go amongst you. I'll be your God. You'll be my nation. Now she says God promises a blessing of special spiritual quality <clears throat> involving intimate knowledge of him. I'll stroll with you in Ganadin. As I, if I were with you, one with you, and you will be, you will not be terrified by me. Now, one might think this will not, you will not fear me under such similar circumstances. Tatev therefore says, and I'm God, your God. Therefore, you'll always respect, there'll be always respect. I'm God, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt. Which to be to you as to be from being as slaves. And I broke the pegs of your yoke. And I have led you upright. As she says, It is worthwhile for you to believe me that I can do this thing. And indeed, I took you out of the land of Egypt and I performed great miracles. Meitais is like a plowing yoke, consists of a bar that is placed over the animal's neck and reins that are placed under his neck and threading through two holes at the end of each bar. This term might refers to type of a peg, which is inserted into two holes at the end of the yoke. These are the pegs, therefore, jam the rein tightly around the holes, preventing the reins from coming off the ox's head Preventing the undoing of the knot, like the, you put the you put the uh, the rope through the hole, and then you take this peg, and you push it into the hole, which creates a strong hold. And Mimiyas came as a kufa in the wreck stature due to relief of bondage. Verse fourteen. If you will not listen to me, you won't do all these commandments. Now she says, to toil in the study of Torah in order to know <clears throat> to what, the, what the expounded of the sages, I might think that this refers to fulfillment of commandments. The Torah says, you will not perform my commandments. So what does again mean? If the Torah says, the fulfillment of the commandments is already stated. So what is the meaning if you do not listen to me? So again, Rashi learns that Rashi learned in the beginning of the Pasha, it means to toil in the Torah. What is the meaning to, of, to me? This is speaking only about someone who knows his master and yet willfully rebels him, against him. Likewise, regarding Nimrod, 
is a powerful hunter before the Lord. It means that he recognized God, but initially rebelled against him. Likewise, regarding people's doim, it says the same thing, very evil and sinful against the Lord. It means that they recognized their master and intentionally rebelled against him. That's a person, that's, that's a terrible person. It's somebody who knows God and still goes against him. If you not learn the Teda, you will be you, you will not perform. Therefore, you're not how can you know what to do if you're not learning? Thereby enumerates two transgressions. Namely, A, not learning Teda. And automatically by not learning Teda, you don't fulfill the commandments. Verse 15 into Bekhis to Mosa. If you despise my statutes, as Mishpate Tigal Nafshachem. And my ordinances, by not performing, you, you, you reject my ordinances. I miss my, my laws. By not performing my commandments. Thereby, thereby breaking my covenant, to break the covenant that I have between you. Now she says, this refers that you despise others who perform commandments. Despise Jews that are following the mitzvahs. You hate, the, you hate the sages. Not only do you mean not performing, not only you don't perform, you don't allow others to perform. As Kala Mitzvah, referring to those that deny I, God, commanded them. This is why the verse says that any of my commandments and not any of the commandments, my commandments. That means a person says, who said God commanded to do anything? Afrias, you see, this is the first one who denies the main tenet of Judaism. That God is the creator of all existence. Hence the verse enumerates seven sins. The first leading to the second and so on until the seventh. And proceeds to denigrate as follows. First, a person does not learn Torah. Then subsequently, he does not fulfill the commandments. Then he despises of those who do fulfill the commandments. Then he hates the rabbis. Then he, he then, then he prevents others. Then he decides and not only I'm not not only they hate them, I'm going to make sure they don't also serve the command. Denies us intensely. Then he denies God said the commandments, and then ultimately what it brings about, he denies God altogether. Verse sixteen. So we'll do for tit for tat. I will do the same to you. I will order upon you shock. The shechefes has a kadachas consumption fever. The chleis and I am a divus nefesh disease that causes hopeless longing and depression. With ratim lerik zarachem, you'll sow your seed in vain. Vachlo evechem, your enemies will eat it. Now she says the the word vivkality. Means vitzivisi, our order. Ashachefes, consumption, this is a disease that consumes the flesh. Blisters that afflict appears like one who had a swelling. And those that swellings have abated, thereby causing a sad appearance to the face due to the stretched skin sagging of the swelling have abated. Kadachas is the illness that makes the body feverish, heating up to making it burn. The friar base kadacha of my wrath. Mechleisa naim. The eyes in Nechem look like anticip anticipation, longing to see the illness will abate, but he will recover. And he will recover, but he eventually does not recover. And depression falls upon the family members when he dies. Any desire that has not realized or prolonged yearning for something is called kiloyin enayin. So to say, the hopeless longing is ratim ladik. You will sow, but it will not grow. And if it grows, your enemies will eat it. I will set my attention upon you. They be smitten before your enemies. They will, your enemies will rule over you. And you will be flee, but no one will be pursuing you. Now she says again, my leisure when it says pane, 
It means God will be fine. He'll, so to say, take a special attention. Your enemies will rule. Radu is the simple term. And they'll rule over you. Now, the uh, Gothic explains that the means that uh, the, 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 this passage begins in verse 16 as taught in Teres Kayanim. So now Rashi goes to the Medrash saying these verses. Afani Efze, I will speak only out of wrath. Like you speak to me in wrath, I will speak out in wrath to you. And I will order upon you the plague you will address Pekedes, you immediately after the other. The first plague will not have finished, and another thing will happen. You will go from Tzadis to Tzadis. Shahak Bahala, the plague of shocks people. And what is that? A plague which cure is anxiously awaited, and when the afflicted die, suddenly people are in shock. It's a shechefes. Sometimes a person is sick and lies in bed, but a flesh as well preserved on him, therefore. Different the is such a chefes, the disease that consumes the flesh. Occasionally a person will be worn out from disease, but is comfortable in that he has no burning fever. Therefore, the Taylor states for Sakadachas and teaches us they afflict with burning with fever. Or sometimes a person may burn burning with fever, but he himself believes that he'll survive. The infantator says it causes hopeless longing. Explain Lobaba and Ashi, that means he'll not recover. Or although he himself does not believe that he will survive, nevertheless, others may believe that he will. The infantator said, Medivas Nefesh. Explain Red Ashi to mean that the family members we afflicted will be depressed due to his death. The Ratim, Ashi continues to explain the previous Psukim. And you will sow seed in vain. You will sow your seed, but will not grow. If this is the case, though, what is your enemies come and eat? That the verse continues, says your enemies will eat it. What circumstance are we speaking here? You will sow your seed one particular year, and it will not grow. Then the following year, it will grow. But then your enemies will come and find the produce from the time of siege. Thus, those inside the besieged cities will be dying from starvation because they have not gathered in the produce from the previous year. Another explanation is you will sow your seed in vain. Is that Tater here is alluding to the sons and daughters. That's what it means, not the seed of the ground. Name that you will invest hard work in your children, rearing them, but the punishment of your sins will come and consume them. As the verse says, those who I have reared and brought up, my enemies have consumed. The Sati Pane Bechem Rashes does as you, you said regarding the good. I will turn to you, so too regarding the bad. I will set my attention against you. Our sages do it parallel to a king who said to his servants when they were not obeying him, I'm now turning my attention away from all my affairs and I'm occupying myself with you to do you harm. Now she says that the deathly plague will kill you inside the besieged cities while your enemies surround you from the outside and rejoice that you are dying off within from the plague. What does that mean? I'll make your enemies stem from within your own people. But at the time that the nations stand up against Israel, they seek out only what is visible as it says and it happens when Israel sowed the Midianite Amalek and the children of Asa came up and they camped against them and destroyed the land of produce the land's produce however when I set up enemies against you from within your own very camp they will seek out the hidden treasures within thus the verse say I ate the flesh of my people and flayed their sin upon them and open up their bones and broke them. The metaphor of breaking bones to get to the marrow within alludes to the enemy seeking out the hidden treasures within. When I ask them to aim, you will flee from fright. For lack of strength. This end of a God explanation given to Teres Kayanam. 
Him verse eighteen in my day late tishmuli. If you're still not going to listen to me, after the yasres, and I'll add another seven punishments. Achatres them on your sin. Now she says, "Vimadela," and if while all this transpires, you don't get the message, "Yisafte Eid Asur Machal Suffer," you will bring him more suffering. Sheva, seven retributions for the seven sins that I've enumerated earlier. Shabbat is going to zechem. I'll break your pride. Nasati shemechem kebazel. I'll make your skies like iron. It's hiding in the cheshes, and your land like copper. Now she says, "I'll break the, the the pride." This is the temple. So here the tailor tells says tailor says that he'll destroy the temple. Nasati shemechem. And I will make your skies like iron and your land like copper. This is more than the severe, it was more severe than Moshe Rabbeinu. But later on in the Eschanan, in the book of Devarim, also Moshe Rabbeinu gives the warnings. For there he says, your skies above will be like copper and your, and your earth like iron. The sky will sweat as copper sweats. and The earth will not sweat just like iron does not sweat. Therefore, the earth will preserve any of its existing fruit. Here, however, is harsh a curse announced by God Himself. The sky will not sweat; it will be like copper. I mean, it will be like iron. Just like iron does not sweat. Therefore, there will be there will be, be drought in the world, while the earth will sweat, just as copper sweats, thus causing the fruit to rot. Verse number 20, V'tam lo dikechachem, your strength will be expanded in vain. V'leititen atzchem v'sivul, and your land will not give its produce. V'etz asal itin piyay, and the trees of the earth will not give forth its fruit. Now she says, in the case of men who did not toil, not having plowed, sown, weed, cut off the thorns, or hood, hood at, at the time of harvest, if, if, if light comes and ruins everything, that others worked on. It does not affect him at all. However, a man who did toil, who plowed, sowed, weeded, cut off the thorn, who did the bright, if light comes and ruins everything, this man's teeth becomes blunt. His spirit shall be broken. And your land will not give its produce even the quantity of seeds that you bring to the field at the time of sowing. Ash says, why then the expression, the tree of the earth, it means that the trees will be smitten even from the earth, for they will not be able to put forth fruits in the season when fruits sprout forth. The production of fruit originates from the earth in which the tree is rooted. The tree will blossom, but the earth will have no power to give forth fruit. Layitin, Ash says, this phrase comes after uh, the tree of the land. This is the fruit. It must be understood to refer to that both phrases which come, which is before it and which is comes after it, the tree and the fruits, and therefore the two separate retributions specified here. Now Rashi is going to express the seven punishments. Leitin is pear. The tree will produce any fruits that will drop off. Thus, the clause of the tree of the land will not give forth fruit represents two separate curses. By identifying the two aspects, Kursi Rashi has shown the verse 1920 have now enumerated seven retributions. Namely, A, breaking the pride of strength. B, making skies like iron. Number three, land like copper. Number four, your strength will be extended in vain. Number five, the land will not yield produce. Number six, the tree will not give forth any fruits, their fruits altogether. Number seven, the fruit that they will produce will fall off the tree. Verse 21 of Himalach, the Mayasibikari, if you continue to teach me half happiness. Well, they say, well, they saw the law, you're not going to listen to me. And I'll add another seven punishments upon your sins. Our rabbi said that this, the word means temporary, keri. The word mikra is something that happens out of some, it's only sometimes. Thus, our verse, if you treat the commandments as hap, hap, 
a temporary, temporary concern. Anachem ben Shruk, however, explains Kedi referring to similar the word Haka, hold back. Also, he says the word Yaka to breathe his breath. And this explanation resembles Uncle's translation, namely the nailing hardness. Kedi is hardness. Those who commit the sin, harden their heart to refrain from coming close to me. Sheva Khataslam, I'll give you seven other punishments. The Minya Sheva, like the seven sins you're doing. Verse 22, I will send the I'll send the wild beasts of the field against you. And they will bereave you. They will all destroy your lifestyle. They meet the Aslam and they'll diminish you. And your, your roads become your road, your roads become desolate. Now she says again, Shlachti expression is citing the Shik lesson. In this verse, I only know the wild beasts will believe you. For this is their nature. How do I know that domestic animals, which are not customed to kill people, they too will kill? Here for the Teddy says, I will incite the teeth of the livestock upon you. Thus there are two punishments, both wild beasts and domestic animals. How do you know they will kill besides bite? Because the verse continues with the venom of the creatures, with the venom of creatures that slither in the dust, just like those snakes killed through their bite. These also killed through their bites. And indeed, there were the years of land of Israel when domestic donkeys would bite and kill, and wild donkeys would bite and kill. He'll breathe you, they will have you, these are the young children. From the outside of your city, from within inside the city. And the the major trails of minor trails. Here are the seven punishments. The teeth of domestic animals, the teeth of wild animals, the venom and quarreling things of the dust. They will, they will be bereaved you, utterly destroy you, six, and diminish you. Number seven, that your roads become de- your roads become dusty. First 20 theme of Ayla did the Vasili. If you're not gonna if you if through these, you will still not be chastised to return. He'll continue to go with me in coldness. I'll go with you in half happiness. I'll add another seven punishments. I'll bring upon you the army that avenges the avenging of the covenant. And I say, you'll be gathered in your cities. I will incite the plague of plague in your midst. It will be delivered in the enemy's hands. Now she says, since the verse, since there is also an avenging which is not of the covenant, not stated in the Torah, such as those in the manner of other avengings, that is, that, that is the blinding of the eyes of Tzitkiyo, the bind, blinding of one who punishment enumerated here, Another explanation of avenging of the covenant. Avenging here is because the, you broke the covenant, namely the Teda. Never the expression of bringing Cherev in the Teda refers to the war of enemy enemies. The Saftem, from the outside to the inside of the cities due to siege. Through this plague, you will be delivered over to your hands of the enemy who will be sieging you. Because since there are many. You want me not allow a dead person to remain in Jerusalem when they bring out the dead to burial, they'll be delivered in the hands of their enemy. Verse 26 When I break you, the staff of bread, ten women will bake your bread in one oven. And they will bring back your bread in, by weight. Chaltem, you will eat. You will be satisfied. Now she says, Mate lechem, Mate, the word is expression of support, food or bread, this is the staff. Mishivre lechem, Mate lechem, I will break every support of bread that you have. 
This refers to the arrows of hunger. When both of these expressions appear, and Radak interprets the arrows of hunger as blight, mildew, and locusts, which destroy most of the grain. Ten people have to cook in one oven because of the lack of wood. mission, the grain will rot, and the bread will become crumbly, breaking apart inside the oven. The woman therefore will sit and weigh the broken pieces, divide amongst themselves. Bachalta and Valetus both describe within the intestines. So here are the seven things that as she says number one, attacking armies, the siege, number three, the plague, number four, destruction of the food supply, number five, the lack of wood, number six, the cumberly bled, number seven, the curse of the intestines. Of course, the claw clause you will deliver it into your hands of the enemy does not count because it's a product of the previous. If you still do not listen to me, and you go with me with, with coldness, I will treat you inferior of this. I'll again add another seven against you. You'll ultimately eat the flesh of your sons, the flesh of your daughters, to fail we eat. And I will demolish. Your edifices may say him, Vecretes Machnechem. I'll cut down your sun idols. The Sati Pigrecha Pigrechem. I'll make your corpse fall upon the corpse of your idols. Regolo Nafshi Aschem. And I will, my spirit will reject you. As she says, My Sechem, the towers and the castles, Chamenechem, the type of idols that would you would place upon the rooftops. And since they would stand, in the sun, they're called the sun idols. And the Sati Brechem, this is how, how so the people will be swollen from starvation. And the fruit of Gresh, they would, the fruit of Gresh, they would take out the idols from the bosom and kiss it. Then their bellies would burst open. This is the departure of the Shina. The Sati Brechem, Harva, and I'll lay your cities to waste. And make your holy places desolate. And I will not take in the pleasantness of your fragrance. Uh, she says, I might think this means desolate of people who reside there. Next test says, I will make your land desolate. Desolate of people who reside there is already stated. So, what does it mean in waste? It means that the land will be desolate of any pass by who will come to visit it. One might think this is means desolate of sacrifice. However, the scripture state, I'll not take partaking of pleasant fragrance. So desolation of sacrifice is stated. So what does it mean? I'll, dig, I'll make your holy places desolate. This means desolate of throngs. These are the caravans of Israelites who prepare themselves and gather to go to the temple. Here are also seven attributes that are enumerated in the verse, corresponding to the seven sins, namely, the eating of the flesh of the sons and daughters, edifices being demolished. Thus we have two. The cutting down of sun idols is not counted as a separate retribution, but rather part of the second one. For as the consequence of the edifice being demolished, the sun idols have been erected and the rooftops are demolished will fall off the building and destroy. I'll make your corpse fall upon the corpse of your idols that makes it three. The departure of the divine presence is four. The sittings laying to waste. The desolation of the holy places of, from throng, throngs of people. And I'll make, and I will not partake in the pleasant fragrance of your sacrifice. In total is seven. Even though the ensuing verse goes on to mention several other additional hardships that are not actually part of the seven, but the Israel will have to endure if they sin. Verse 32, I'll make the land desolate. The Shamala and I'll be, it'll become it will so become desolate also of your enemies who live upon it. Now she says this is actually a good thing for Israel. Namely, since the land will be desolate of people living in it, the enemies will find the contempt in, contempt in, the, in Israel in the land. They're not going to want to either live in the land of Israel. 
So the land will actually become empty. Verse 33, and then I will scatter you amongst the nations of the world. And I will unsheath the, the sword after you. And your land will be desolate. And your cities will be laid to waste. Now she says, this though is a harsh thing for Israel. But when, it, when people of a country are exiled to the same place, they see each other and find solace. However, Israel will be scattered as through the winnowing basket. Just as a person scatters barely through a sieve, so too, not one of them will attach to another. They're going to be in different parts of the world. But a casey, an unsheath, I will empty out, which means here the unsheath, because one who unsheaths a sword, is the sheath is emptied. Sword will take it out against you and return and not return quickly. This is like a person who empties out a pitcher of water, which does not return to the pitcher. For you will not hasten to return to unto it. And subsequently your cities will be laid to waste, meaning they will appear to you having permanently laid to waste. When a person is exiled from his house, from his vineyard, from a city, but he knows that he will ultimately return. His eyes, as it were, through his vineyard and a house are not laid to waste. We're here since Israel will give up hope, return to the land. It will appear to them to have been laid to waste. Verse 34, As Tietzah, as has said, then the land will be appeased regarding the sabbatical years. Call you may Hashama all the days that remains desolate. You are in the land of your enemies. As Tishbis Ardis, then the land will rest. It's Yisrael said, appease its sabbatical years. Now she says, As Tietzah, the verb, then the land will be appeased and turn appeased of the anger of God, who has been angry regarding the land of Shemitah, that you didn't keep the Shemitah. Hitzah, the verb, caused the meaning that the land will be appeased, the king regarding its sabbatical years. Verse 35, It will rest during the day, all the days that remains desolate, whenever it's not been rested on the sabbatical years, when you lived upon it. Now she says the word hashama is a passive form just of the word ha'asais, being desolate. The root of the word shamim is actually is two letters, mem. In our word, you should therefore read hashamama. That's it should have been extra mem. Since it's difficult to pronounce, however, the first mem is vocalized as a dogish, hashama. So she replaces the second mem rather than having the full word, a double mem. Rashi now goes and explains the 40 years, the 70 years of exile between the first temple and the second temple. 70 years of the Babylonian exile between the destruction of the first temple and the building of the second temple correspond to the 70 years of the Shemitah, the jubilee years that took place during the years from the Israel angered God while they in the land, a total of 430 years. But when they came into the, into the base, when, when the, the 430 years that they stopped keeping Shemitah. 390 years were from the years of the sinning from when they entered in the land until the 10 tribes were exiled. And the people of Judah angered him for 40 more years from the, 10, from the time the 10 tribes were exiled until the destruction of Jerusalem. This is what he refers to in the when God, when Ezekiel figured this suffers one day for each year Israel sinned in order to atone for the sins. And then you shall lie in your left side, symbolizing the house of Israel and the ten tribes. Now I have made for you the years from their in, in, in iniquity for the number of days, 390, 395 days. You shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when you, when you complete these, you shall lie on your right side a second time he shall bear the iniquities of the house of Judah for 40 days. Now this prophecy was set to Yechaskel in the 50th year of the king Yerachon exile. Since the people of Yehuda spent another six years in the land until 
Tifkio exile, totaling 46 sinful years of the house of Yehuda, and hence 850 years the people of Israel spent from the time of their entry into the land until they eventually exiled from it after the destruction of the first temple, they sinned a total of 436 years. Because they were there 840, 850 years. Now, you might object that the king Menashe, who was born immediately after the 10 tribes were exiled, and ruled for 55 years. And so even without taking account the sinful years during the reign of all the other kings of Judah, 55 years alone is more than 46. So surely the calculation is incorrect. However, Manasseh repented his evil ways for 33 of his 50 of his 55 years of his reign. And thus his sinful years amount to 22 years. As written, he made Ashda in Asheda in Ahab, the king of Israel, and made Ahab rule for 22 sinful years. So to Menashe, 22 in his, of his 55-year reign. And the taught in Agada, the 11th chapter of Tractate of Sanhedrin. Thus the number of years the house of Judah sinned was 22 years during the reign of Menashe, 2 during the reign of Ammon, 11 during the reign of Sitkio, and that's a total of 46 years. The other kings of Judah were not included in the calculation because, because during their righteous, because during the righteous Joas's resign, Israel did not sin. While Jehachav and Jehachav each ruled for no, for only three months. Let us now go to cal and calculate the period of 436 years of sin. How many Shemitahs and Jubilees transpired during those years? A rate of 16 in every 100 years. 14 Schmitter, 14 Schmitter years and two Jubileas during 16 sabbatical years. Therefore, for 400 years, we have 64, and the remaining 36 years, there's five cycles and seven years, plus seven Schmitters, making a total of 64 and five. And five, 70 minus one, 69 observed sabbatical years and a total of 436 years, sinful years of that period. I must uh, add to this calculation an extra year. This extra year was the last sinful year of the 436, which was begun another Shemitah cycle. And God exited Israel then did not wait to, to completion of the cycle until the, the desecrate of the seventh Shemitah year out of mercy for them. They would not have to endure the punishment of other destruction. Oh. Okay, so ultimately that's a, that actually calculates 70 years of Shemitah. Verse number 36. Those who survive will bring fear in their hearts. Righteous away from the land of their enemies of Adat Bethlehem, and they will, uh, they will, uh, and the sound of rustling leaf will pursue them. Fell ill of Nidok, but Nasum and Nusus Cherev, and they will flee like one flees of the sword. Benaflu, and they will fall. Vein Reda, but nobody is actually pursuing them. Now she says, "Evasim Meirach." The word Meirach means fear. You'll run, you'll flee from the floor as if murderers are pursuing you. Alif Nidav is the Ali Niva is the pushed leaf that the wind pushes, striking against another leaf. So it knocks and makes a sound. That's how the tiger teaches it. Verse 37, and each man will stumble over his brother. Because of the sword. But nobody's chasing them. You will not be able to stand before your enemies. Now she says, when you, they run away to flee, they will stumble over each other because they flee in panic. As if fleeing from people who want to kill them, for they will have fear in their hearts 
and every moment they will think that someone is chasing them. The Medish explains, because each man will stumble because of his brother, meaning one person will stumble because of someone else's sins, because all Jews are guarantors for one another. You will be lost among the nations. They will eat you. Eretz Eveichem in the land of your enemies. As she says, they will, you, when you will be scattered, you will become lost to one another. If it refers to the Jews who will die in the diaspora. And, the, or, and because of their iniquities, those who will survive will run away. In the land of their enemies. Moreover, they will rot because of the iniquities of their fathers are still with them. I said to talk about the, the, if they hold on to the iniquity, the evil of their parents. Yimaku, Lashana Masra, Yimaku is a, is a concept of melting, like melt away. His father is Avenam, and they will confess their sin. The sins. The sins of the fathers, be in their betrayal that they dealt with me. That they went with me in the continue verse 41. I will continue to go with you in coldness. I'll bring them to the land of their enemies. Or the, 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 if then their clogged hearts become humbled and their suffering, then their suffering will gain us appeasement for their iniquities. Now she says, I myself will bring them back. This is a good thing for Israel. So that does not say since we have been exiled amongst the nations, we may be as well be like them. Says God, answer this, I will not allow them to do this. Rather, I will set up my prophets and bring them back to me, to under my wings. And it says, but what will enter your minds so you not come about? What you, what you say, let us be like the nations, like the families of the land serving wood and stone. As I live, says God, surely with a strong hand and with the outstretched arm and with a poured out fury, I'll reign over you. Is this an unusual expression? It's known as similar habitual. That's the meaning of the verses. If they want to become like the nations, I will have to take them back to me against their will. The clogged hearts then, because of because humble. Without force, the suffering will atone for them. Mean they will get an atonement for their iniquities through their suffering. Verse 42. We end with good, thank God. I'm going to remember the covenant of Jacob. I'll remember the covenant of Isaac. I'll remember the covenant of Abraham. I'll remember the land. Now she says, the name of Yaakov over here is written with the with a, with a vav. The name of Yaakov is written full with a vav, five places. And Eliyahu is written defectively without a vav, also in five places. So Yaakov took the letter vav of the name of Eliyahu, the prophet, as a security that will come and, and he'll, he won't forget to come and to and to herald the coming of Mashiach. So Yaakov hijacked Elio, so to say, to make sure that he doesn't forget his job. And since Elio's mission in life, his name will remain incomplete, as it were, until he fulfills it, his mission. And his mission is to come and mount the coming of Mashiach. Why are the forefathers enumerated in the, in the reverse order? Why does it mention Yaakov, Yitzhak, and, and Abraham? Why didn't he do the other way? To inform us that the youngest patriarch, Jacob, is alone worthy of this. That Israel will be redeemed through the merit of him alone. But if it's not enough, then Isaac together with him. And if it's not enough, then Abraham together with him. 
is certainly worthy. And why is this expression remembering not used by Isaac? It doesn't say, I'll remember Isaac. It says, I'll remember Jacob and I'll remember Abraham. Because Isaac ashes, so to say, always appears before him, gathered up in the place of the altar. Isaac is always remembered as self-sacrifice. Verse 43, and the land will be reft of them. But Tidish Shashat said, appeasing of its sabbatical years, Basham and Mehem, when it was desolate of them, and they will gain appeasement of their iniquities. This is all retribution of having despised my ordinances. Then retribution for having rejected my, my statutes. Verse 44. even. But despite all this, God says, while they're in the land of their enemies, I will not be despised of them. I will never reject them to annihilate the Jewish people. To break my covenant with them, I will always have my covenant with them. Because I am God, your God. Now she says, moreover, even, I, even, even though I meted out this, this retribution upon them, which I've described in this whole chapter, when they are in the land of their enemies, nevertheless, I will not despise them to annihilate them. Thereby breaking my covenant with them, the Jews will survive. I will remember the first covenant I've done with them. I shall say, says the man, time I took them out of the land of Egypt, laying our game to the front of the eyes of the nation. Leas lahem lelekim to beat them as a god. Ani Hashem, I am God. Hashem bishushen what was the first covenant with the tribes? Ela verse forty six. Ela chukim v'mishpatim v'ateres. These are the statutes, the ordinances, the law. The Lord gave. Not Hashem beinay beinay saw the whole gave between him and the Jewish people. By Sinai in the mountain of Sinai, he had Moshe in the hand of Moshe. Now she says the word Vatayres, the Torah, which is plural. You should have said Vatayra and the Torah. But here we learn the nature of two Torahs. One, the written Torah, Torah Shabbat and also the Torah Shabbat It's Later on, people will make the mistake of thinking the only Torah Shabbat the written law was given to Moshe Rabbeinu, not the Torah Shabbat Therefore, the Tate over here writes the Tate is in a plural sense. And that completes the Chumash for today. Continue the Tanya of the day, the today. We continue chapter 49 in Tanya. The Alter Rebbe will soon conclude the meditation on the concepts appearing in the blessings of the Shema. The Alter Rebbe talked about the two verses, the two, two blessings before the Shema we say every day, Yitzhar and Avar Ava Soilam. The first blessing talks about the greatness of the angels, how they praise God. And that's their whole Aveda praising your God, and they still are in search of godliness. And they ask the question, I am a Kaim Kaveda, where is the they're all searching for God? They're also want to connect to God. They want to have this revelation. But they ask the question, even though they're such spiritual entities, they don't see God. And they say, where is God? The fills the world. And where does he fill within the world? A holy place where he makes it a Makam Kaddish, where a Jew makes in this world a holy place. That's where God is found. That's why the second bracha comes to Avar Asaylam, how much God loves this world. How much God loves a simple mitzvah that a Jew does in this world. Because there he accomplishes the true concept of revelation of God in this world, why he created the world. So he created all the upper worlds and the lower worlds all for this concept of this revelation. Now the Rebbe will soon conclude the meditation concept of appearing in the blessings of the Shema, leading you to a proper realization of the Shema. And what does the Shema mean? What is he trying to accomplish with this prayer? 
to attain a dint love because he wants to create a relationship with God. Just like God wants to create a relationship with the world, with him. So to every Jew also loves God and wants to create a relationship with, the, with God. That's what Alta Rebbe says. When the thinking person will reflect on these matters in the depths of his heart and in his brain. As I memele, then as surely as water mirrors the image of the face, if he understands how God wants this relationship with him, then he'll mirror it automatically. He will want this relationship with God. When love likens to water mirroring the image of the face takes effect in a person so that God's manifest love for his people arouses in him a corresponding love towards God. And to slide, nafshay, with diva, his soul will spontaneously be kindled with the love of God and will be clothed itself in a spirit of benevolence. Lisnadi, so willingly, he will lay down to lay down and, and 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 resolutely to abandon to abandon all he possesses. As he says, if I have a love of if I realize how much God loves me and how much God is waiting for me, I would run to God and put everything aside. Nothing is more important than this relationship. In order to cleave to him to him and to absorb into his light with attachment and longing and so forth. In a manner of kissing, with attachment, spirit to spirit. Which I mentioned before. So just like kissing involves not only the cleaving of mouth, but also the communion of breath, so too does the spiritual unity involve the union of man's spirit with God. Man's spirit becomes one with God. How we do this practically? How does one attach spirit to spirit take place? Meaning, what measures are to be taken if one seeks to desire to cleave to him? Practically, sounds like a great thing. We can understand it in a human relationship. But how does we do that with God? Therefore, the pastor continues. It says, you will, you will, you, with all your heart, you will, the phrase, all your heart, and so on. And the words will be upon your heart, and you shall speak of them, Midi Bartha. I will soon be explained that this refers to immerse yourself in the study of Taita and speaking the words of Taita. When we speak, we speak with our breath. And when we speak with the words of Taita, our breath becomes part of God's breath. And that's the way. We have Rucha Berucha, which cultivates time as it's brought down in Kabbalah. That the union of kissing in a spiritual sense, which incorporates a human attachment of spirit of spirit, is essential human of Chabad with Chabad. What does it mean, kissing God? Is when we have Chabad with Chabad, Chabad of a person, the union of man's Chachma bin and Das. The Chachma bin Adas with the with the concentration of Taita, which is God Chachma bin Adas, which unites man's Chabad with the intellect of love of with the intellect of Taita. That is the ultimate concept of kissing. And how do you kiss with your mouth? And that's the way we do it. You have to say the Taita. Not only it has to be within your brain, and you have to contemplate the Taita. You have to speak the words of Taita. Speak the words of Taylor. That's not only do you have it spirit to spirit in a an, in an, in an spiritual way. You have it ultimately through the mouth. As the outlet of the breath and its emergence into the revealed state presents the category of speech engaged in the words of Taylor. And that's the ultimate to be created in a spiritual sense. Of what ex- expressed by da- by Shlomo Amela, that we hug each other, we hug God, we kiss God, we um, 
we connect spirit to spirit with God. And, and we comprehend that, that the Abishtu wants that, so that God is part of us. But the Abishtu wants that we should go from the bottom up, just like he comes from the, from, from the up to, from the, from the, from above to below. The Abishtu wants we should have the same response from below to above. And that completes the Tanya of the day. Well, with the long chitas today, today is the 21st day of the month. No, today is the 20th day of the month, which is chapter 97 to chapter 103. If you do those seven chapters, you do the chitas of the day. Wish you all a wonderful day in the mid Shem. See you tomorrow. 8 a.m. Continue the chitas of the day. Have a wonderful and beautiful day.